to the sky. All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in our session. Uh, today, this session is titled Holistic Approaches to Open Science and Publishing Infrastructures, Case Studies from Carnegie Mellon University and F1000. My name is Chaz Griego, and I'm an Open Science Postdoctoral Associate at the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. And I'm Emily Farrell. I'm the Director of Open Research for the Americas at Taylor and Francis and F1000. So we're going to start just by giving you an overview of what this session is going to be about. Um, so first of all, we at F1000 and also Carnegie Mellon University Libraries are going to talk a bit about how we're addressing the changes in the research life cycle, how our models have been changing and shifting and what we're doing to try to address those changes. Um, we'll also both talk about what's working, what the challenges have been and what we're working on next. So we're going to do that first. Um, a bit of an overview of open science. Chaz will talk about Carnegie Mellon. I'll talk about F1000 and we'll have some time for discussion at the end. So next slide, please. So before we dive into it, we wanted to start out with the baseline of where we're working from. Um, so moving beyond just open access, where the focus has really been on the final output and the opening of journal articles or book chapters and books. The shift to open science and open research has really been one that, that looks at openness across the research life cycle. So as a definition using this from Foster Open Science, we view it as the practice of science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute where research data, lab notes and other research processes are freely available under terms that enable reuse, distribution and reproduction and the research and its underlying data methods. So a much broader view of, of openness and the pieces of have how that fit together. Next slide. And that of course means that we're engaging with a lot more stakeholders across the research process. So stakeholders in open research involve funders and institutions and publishers who want to support robust research, reproducible research, accessibility and reuse of research outputs, but also, of course, researchers who are interested in gaining higher impact and engagement for their research outputs, um, seeing the, their work reused and in increasing collaboration. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chaz to talk about the work that's being done at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. OK, thank you, Emily. Um, so then I'll, I'm going to go ahead and start with our uh, overviews about um, our different models. And so I'll be starting with mine with the CMU Open Science and Data Collaborations Program, which you'll see further is abbreviated as OSDC or CMU OSDC. So first I'd like to talk about the research life cycle and its uh, many stages, designing and planning experiments, analyzing data, publishing uh, your findings and so on. And so, more commonly, the standard approach in university libraries is to support this life cycle near the end in the publishing and archiving phase by, for instance, offering uh, open access publishing funds or institutional repositories. But suppose uh, a newer concept where libraries can support the research life cycle from end to end. And so here is where I'd like to introduce more of the specifics of the OSDC program, where we offer end-to-end -end tools and services. And so if you kind of look over at this diagram, um, in gray are general services offered by the CMU libraries, and then in red are more specific um, factors that the OSDC contributes. And you can see that these boxes can correspond with different stages in this life cycle. And so kind of reading top to bottom, left to right, some of these uh, platforms that we have institutional licenses include lab archives, something that someone can use to prepare digital notebooks. Um, in the collecting and analyzing phase, we offer consultations, workshops, and support for uh, practices with R and Python. And then going forward, we offer licenses for protocols.io for users to list uh, their research protocols, open science framework to prepare um, a place to host their research projects and prepare uh, registered reports, etc. And then going to the left, uh, going back to institutional uh, repositories, we have Kilt Hub, which uh, students and researchers can use to host their data sets. 
uh, publication preprints, et cetera. And then at the bottom, we can see that we have um, events and workshops that cover um, this entire cycle where we can kind of bring a community together and uh, talk about their open science practices anywhere in their research. At the very bottom, uh, one instance is that we have the data collab, which was a community where users who, who needed help with data, who wanted to develop collaborations and have a longer term project could come together and be matched with consultants to be able to build those connections. And so that's an overview of our model and this newer concept and essentially uh, talking about the what's important and what's kind of the takeaway of this newer model is that here with the OSDC, we can offer focused open science support. So someone can come in and approach us at any stage in their research and get support related to that area. But not only is it focused, but this support can transfer between these different stages. As you can see, many of these services translate between more than one, but then also they're building these uh, relationships with our consultants to be able to navigate further along their process. And then along the way, whether it's through events or consultations, community can be built and collaborations can be formed. And this brings the community together further with the libraries to kind of help promote successful open science research. So now we can talk about what's been working with this existing program. And so our team in the past uh, developed some performance metrics to kind of assess what's working, kind of the what, when, and where. And so starting where, um, we can look at what's working uh, broken down by departments at CMU. And so in this figure here, we have counts of users based on CMU departments. And we can see that we have hundreds of users um, among multiple departments. And some of our uh, top departments that are involved outside of the university libraries are the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policies, Biology and Psychology. And these are more um, you know, traditional departments that uh, are more engaged traditionally with the libraries. And so we are getting some more involvement in other departments and we hope to see growth in those. And then looking out, specifically what's working, looking at our activities and the related outputs. Here again, I have many of the services I spoke of before listed under this activities tab on the left and they're kind of bunched together based on similarity. And to the right, we have outputs that correspond to each. And so what we've seen so far is uh, usage in our repository Kilt Hub with over 437 deposits. Uh, participation with open science framework um, where we see research projects that are not seen in Kill Hub, and that's about 370. And over the years, uh, we've had about 20 workshops per year and from there over 270 participants. And then our two day long events per year with over 230 participants. And we also have a newsletter with over 500 subscribers currently. And finally, what's working over time? We can kind of look at the growth of our users over time based on uh, different platforms that they're using, such as Kilt Hub, Lab Archives, and Protocols.io. And we can see going from 2019 to 2021, we're seeing a user increase from year to year. So that's what's working. And so now I'd kind of just like to outline what's challenging us and what are our next steps. So as you've seen, we looked at these performance metrics to kind of answer what, when, where, but the most important question would be able to answer why our users are interacting with the OSDC. And some of the next steps that we can consider to learn this is to survey many of our previous users. Um, we've also constructed an advisory board from some of our super users so we can continue to consult them. And then overall, just try to identify what interests and incentives promote usage uh, of our services and participating with open science. Our next challenge is uh, coexisting with other existing services in the library. Uh, for instance, I mentioned the data collab, which was meant more for someone who needs help with data that can build a collaboration with a consultant and kind of conduct a, long, uh, a longer term project. 
this kind of clashes with someone who might need regular data consultation brought to you, brought to us by um, our regular data consultants. And so there's kind of a disconnect between the people who want a longer term collaboration and those who might just need a uh, quicker consultation. And so with that, we're kind of trying to start from the beginning and to make something a little more cohesive between the two. And then finally, uh, we also have other open initiatives in the library, including open educational resources and a new open source programs office related to uh, open source software. And so we'd like to become more cohesive with them and collaborate with them as well. And then finally, just measuring some more outcomes, uh, maybe measuring uh, how these tools we promote aid re reproducibility and seeing if there are any advocates of open science and CMU that we've helped create. And finally, one thing I'd just like to mention is that uh, we described our performance metrics um, in a publication shown here in F1000 Research. And um, a couple notes from our lead author, uh, Wajin Wang, who's now working for Center for Open Science. When choosing this, uh, this publishing platform for their study, they felt that it had the right audience. Uh, they agreed with the open access approach and a very uh, easy peer review uh, experience. And so they chose F1000 because it was a very good choice in terms of the scope and the audience being able to reach not just library affiliates, but also uh, researchers and publishers and overall just the open access nature and the uh, open peer review. And so if you're more interested in this publication, I have a DOI listed here below. Um, and if you need to get it elsewhere, you can reach out to me. But with that, um, now that I've kind of hinted now about the F1000 uh, publishing platform, Emily will go ahead and speak more about it in detail. Thanks, Taz. Um, so to, to start, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the F1000 model itself and um, the way that it mirrors the process that uh, Carnegie Mellon University Libraries have been going through trying to address how you work with researchers across the research life cycle. So I think it's it's interesting to see the the division sort of between you know, designing, planning, collecting, and analyzing data across research, and those are mirrored in the in the spaces that F1000 is also working to engage. So, a quick overview of the model um, itself uh, and a bit of background. F1000 launched almost ten years ago, uh, 2013, and the idea was to try to uh, rethink some of the scholarly communication system to to offer an, an innovative platform that could speed up research, so make publishing more rapid, um, to help improve transparency of peer review through an open peer review process, and to sort of work on the, the challenges, the crises, if you like, of reproducibility and replicability of research. Um, so using things like um, uh, fair data compliant, um, fair compliant data policies. Um, so the, the and the model itself includes the ability to publish all different types of, of research. Um, at the moment, it still does lean towards bi biomedical sciences on the platform, um, but about 40 and 40% 40 of the, the content is clinical and health sciences publish, publishing. But I'll talk a bit more in a minute too about how we're engaging more with social sciences and humanities. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of different types of input and uh, and the model itself starts with article submission and articles or whichever type of article submitted is vetted internally by by our teams at F1000 and is published very quickly. So it's made available to read in about 14 days. Um, once that's done, um, the the peer review or the publication data is verified as well, making sure that the open uh, data, uh, that the data complies to open policies. Um, and then, and it's given a DOI and indexed with Google Scholar. So it is available to cite immediately and it's accessible for the wider community um, very quickly. And then it starts to go through the peer review process. So. We authors help provide um, peer review peer reviewer suggestions. Um, and then once the peer review process is initiated, um, then that's when the uh, the process starts to to verify the work 
and then to head it towards indexing. Um, but it is still available at that, uh, to read by anybody at that point, like a preprint. Um, the the re two reviewers go through the process and the article is either given a full approval with the check mark that you can see there, or it's given approval with revisions um, and then, or it can be rejected. Um, if it gets a rejection, that still remains on the platform and these, um, the open peer review processes, the reviews are available to read and the name and, and affiliation of the, the reviewer is available for, for anybody to see. Um, authors then go back and work on revisions and include in their, um, their revisions of how they are addressing the comments from the reviewers. Um, once, the, um, once the reviews are up and the paper has been approved, um, it then goes out to, to indexes once it either has um, two approvals or one approval and one full approval and one approval with reservations, um, then it goes and goes on to be indexed in PubMed, Scopus, Crossref and other major indexes. So it's um, discoverable. Uh, but once, even then, once peer review is complete, authors can still submit revised or updated versions. So it allows authors, researchers to really, um, to expand the work, to make sure that it's linked to each other um, and Therefore, the article is a bit more like a dynamic and, and living document um, and can accommodate, say, small changes in the field um, that researchers might want to include. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see that to um, considering the, the benefit of having the ab ability to include a range of different types of articles, um, and flexibility on the article types that, that the platform can, can manage. Um, so you can see that sort of across, across the research life cycle. So um, if you imagine you're starting at the top with a research concept, you can at that point as you're developing your research, the ideas, the plan for your research, you can publish a review, a registered re report. As you continue further, there's space to do method articles, study protocols, onward into things like brief reviews, um, data notes, once you have your data published um, or available, you can do method articles later on. And then of course, towards the end of your research, you can work on research articles or um, other types of publications. We can, F1000 is also now accommodating book publications. So it really aims to work across the, the process of research to allow for more discoverability um, and, and more engagement with the research community. Um, next slide, please. A little bit more too about the open peer review process. So you can see here one example of what a paper looks like once it's up. Um, you can see that it includes um, the standard types of metrics, like the views, um, the downloads. Um, you can also have the usual sorts of um, citation features. Um, and then you can see that on the platform itself, it's quite visible where what the status is of the peer review whether it's been approved at what round. So this particular example, the first reviewer gave um, an approval immediately. The second reviewer asked for some, some revisions. Um, those were done by the authors and then it was resubmitted and approved. And so then moved on to be indexed. Um, next slide, please. You can also see comments from authors about how the, um, the, re the revisions and the re how the, the review's been addressed, which makes it again more transparent and more there's more accountability for, for both the revisions done by authors, but also for, for the reviewers themselves. Um, so you can you can see what the, the responses are and, and, and connect that to the version of the paper and look across those to connect them. Next slide, please. So in summary, the the model, the F1000 model, similar to the ways that Carnegie Mellon is addressing changes in, in the research process through their, their library and changes, um, the model, this model really does respond to the, the real call for more rapid publication. Um, 
and that's come from many different disciplines. Um, the fact that peer review is more transparent um, allows for more engagement and the ability to see who the reviewers are and, and how, how the review process is being done. Um, it also, the platform also adds the, the ability to sort of account for what's happening across the research journey to make those, the pieces available through different article types. Um, open data also adds to the ability to, to you know, reproduce and um, the research. The connecting of versions, unlike a lot of cases with preprints, you do have the connection of the pre or the publication version and the reviewed version. You can see the different versions of the article and they stay connected because of the, the single space. Um, it also still goes through the process of indexing with Google Scholar and Pub PubMed Central. So there is a real concern for discoverability as well. Um, and there's also the ability in the ways that we're, we're partnering, F1000 is partnering with dif different institutions to really highlight particular disciplines and types of research, because we're, we're also pretty keenly aware that different researchers have different needs in terms of their types of publication. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that now in the next slide, um, what's, what's been working and, and some of the things that are, that are a bit of a challenge. Next slide. So, so far the response to the, the innovative model in the, in the first, um, in the, the years since F1000 launched, the rapid review, the rapid publication um, is working well The and the community peer review, adding to transparency, the linking of versions um, and, and the diverse article types. All of these are, are pieces of the model that work very well. Um, and the engagement with, with the partners that we're working with and the researchers that are use, using the platform. So you can see um, some of the metrics from the Gates um, open research platform. Um, the, the number of peer reviewed reports, for instance, there are over a thousand peer reviewed reports that you can read, um, over 361 articles in total. We're seeing a lot of a lot of attention to those articles, um, a lot of citation, um, but also beyond that, we're we're seeing engagement with um, policy documentation, for instance. So an increase in citation, as you often see with with open research, but also things like um, this this particular platform is seeing engagement with World Health Organization um, policy documents, um, as well as. Uh, engagement with with media coverage for articles on the platform. So there, there is engagement beyond um, what we, you would see in a closed journal. Um, some of the things that do present a challenge in using a model that is really does flip things on its head, um, where with the publication followed by peer review, um, it does make it challenging in the face of existing structures. So where an impact factor is required, that can be a challenge. Um, where researchers want a more traditional pathway um, and that often with tenure and promotion, the, um, the ways that uh, publication is incentivized doesn't necessarily fit with an experimental model like this. Um, I think like many places, the challenge of finding peer reviewers is something that F1000 is managing with. And then also just the visibility for the model, the fact that it does uh, take a different approach than, than many other types of platforms out there. It, it isn't, um, you know, it's, it's doing something different with the open peer review and the open processes and article types than, than other types of model, but that does make the, 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 the difference of the model still presents a challenge. In terms of what we're doing next, um, next slide, please. The one of the main things that we're, we've been working on is considering how we do better uh, in engaging with humanities and social sciences researchers. You see, we launched Routledge Open Research, which um, works specifically in, in humanities and social sciences disciplines. And one of the core things that had to be thought about was how we manage the open data policy with researchers in these disciplines, because it does require 
a different sort of thinking. So we do now have an open data policy that is specifically targeted towards the sorts of needs of hum humanities and social sciences researchers. We're also working on different them thematic gateways, drawing together research under different types of disciplinary areas. So for instance, develop developmental psychology and cognition and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So broader thematic areas. We also work on, on sub-disciplinary collections. So for instance, um, diversity, inclusion, and equity in game development and design or AI for music, um, workplace ostracism and inclusion. These are just some of the collections that we have uh, this year. And the paper that Chaz referenced is uh, up on a, a collection on research on research um, policy and culture. So drawing these together with uh, with disciplinary um, advisors that uh, have have some um, offer advice on how how these collections are coming together and have specialties in these areas. We've also started working um, at the national level. We've launched a Japan institutional gateway that works um, on open research in Japan. Um, and through a lot of these partnerships, we're working collaboratively to develop um, different types of articles that are more suited for, for, for different uh, disciplines, different types of researchers, um, different organisations and funders, such that there's enough flexibility to, to ensure that we're, we're working to serve, the, serve researchers in the ways that, that are needed as, the, the, uh, as fields develop. So with that, we are now at, um, at question time. So I think that is the end of the recorded session. Um, and we now go to a live question and answer. So I think now we can we can close the recording and move over. Thank you so much. Thank you.